Let's say I choose to surprise my friends with some cookies. I bring a bag of 100 cookies that they can't look into and tell them that they can have 30 cookies from the bag. A fun fact about my friends is that they love chocolate chip cookies and hate snickerdoodle cookies. But I couldn't find 100 chocolate chip cookies at the store, so I tell them that I got 50 snickerdoodle cookies and 50 chocolate chip cookies. Since around half of the cookies are chocolate chip, my friends expect that if they draw 30 cookies from the bag, around 15 should be chocolate chip. Of course, they could get unlucky and end up with 17 snickerdoodle cookies and only 13 chocolate chip cookies. While they would probably be a little frustrated, they wouldn't think too much of it. But what if they picked 30 cookies from the bag and 29 were snickerdoodle and only one was chocolate chip? Of course, this is possible, but if we really had 50 of each kind, this would be really unlikely. In fact, the chance of getting 29 snickerdoodle and one chocolate chip cookies in this situation is only 0.0000029%. So if this happened to my friend, they would probably suspect that something is up. Maybe the bag has 90 snickerdoodle cookies and only 10 chocolate chip ones. Either way, we can use the likelihood of the outcome that we got in order to validate or invalidate the assumptions we made about a system. The process of doing this is what's covered in a branch of statistics called hypothesis testing. In this example, we can see the likelihood that we got X chocolate chip and Y snickerdoodle cookies in order to check whether our information about how many of each kind of cookie was in the bag to begin with was correct. But there are lots of different things hypothesis testing can help us figure out. For example, is the mutant amount of chips in a bag really 28 grams like it says on the package? Do these batteries really last 30% longer than these ones? Hypothesis tests follow a certain flow. First, we make assumptions about our situation, and then we use those assumptions to choose a statistical distribution function and a null hypothesis. In oversimplified terms, a statistical distribution function shows how likely something is to occur. From a graphical perspective, the area under a particular region in a distribution function represents the likelihood that that event will occur. There are different statistical distribution functions which model the behavior of different scenarios. Different parameters, which you can decide based on your assumptions, will change the shape of a particular distribution function. For example, a normal distribution function is changed by the parameters of mean and standard deviation. The shape of a chi-square distribution is changed by the number of degrees of freedom. Learning more about these distribution functions and which specific scenarios they model will tell you which one to use for the situation in your hypothesis test and which parameters to choose. Now that we understand a little bit more about the distribution function, let's take a look at the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is essentially what we are testing to be true. In plain language, it can look something like, the chance of getting a snickerdoodle cookie is equal to the chance of getting a chocolate chip cookie, or the mean value of the mass of chips in a bag is 28 grams. This is what we are assuming to be true and trying to prove otherwise with our statistical test. Usually, we have an alternative hypothesis as well, which can be our alternative claim. It can look something like the chance of getting a snickerdoodle cookie is higher than the chance of getting a chocolate chip cookie, or the mean value of the chip mass in the bag is less than 28 grams. The hypothesis test works by assuming the null hypothesis is true and then calculating the likelihood of getting our situation in that scenario. If the likelihood is really small, then we can reject the null hypothesis and assume that something else must be the case. But how unlikely is too unlikely? At what point do we decide, yeah, this isn't feasible and reject our null hypothesis and our assumptions? Does there need to be a 20% chance of it happening? A 5% chance? A 1% chance? The answer is, it's up to you. Different applications have different tolerances for error, meaning you can have a tighter criteria or a more lenient one. Typically, we use 5% and denote it with the parameter alpha, or the significance level. If the likelihood of getting our outcome is less than 5%, then we can reject the null hypothesis. Enough of the theory, let's see it in practice. In our cookie example, we have two outcomes. We can either get a chocolate chip cookie or a snickerdoodle cookie. The distribution function that models the situation where there are two outcomes is called a binomial distribution. The binomial distribution is a discrete distribution, which means it can only model integer outcomes. This is basically saying that it can tell you the probability of getting 20 or 30 chocolate chip cookies, but it couldn't tell you the probability of getting 22.5 chocolate chip cookies because that just doesn't exist. The binomial distribution function looks like this, where the x-axis essentially says how many times did we get one of the two outcomes. Remember, when we measure our event, it's going to fall somewhere along this curve, and then we can figure out the likelihood of it happening. If it's too far out towards the end, then we can say the chance of it happening is too low to be possible, and we can reject the null hypothesis. 
But does it matter which end it goes towards? Is either end fine? The answer is, it's also up to you. For example, if we're expecting the amount of chocolate chip cookies to be larger than what was promised, we draw a critical region like this. If we think it's smaller, then we draw a critical region like this. These are called one-tailed tests. If we don't know whether the true number is smaller or larger, but just suspect that it's different, we can actually split the critical region like this. This is called a two-tailed test, and it means that we could either draw a number of chocolate chip cookies that's way higher or way lower than expected to prove our point. Just remember that the area of the critical region is still the same area as our significance level, alpha, so if we do a two-tailed test, it has to fall further away from the middle of the curve for us to consider it statistically significant. Since our friends think we are trying to double-cross them by putting less chocolate chip cookies in the bag, they are going to do a left-sided test. Our null hypothesis will be that the number of each type of cookies is the same. If P represents the proportion of chocolate chip cookies in the bag, and Q represents the proportion of snickerdoodle cookies in the bag, then our null hypothesis is that P equals 0.5. Since we are doing a left-sided test, our alternative hypothesis will be that P is less than 0.5, since our friends suspect that there are secretly more snickerdoodle cookies in the bag. Let's say our friends draw 30 cookies from the bag and they get 12 chocolate chip ones. This is the formula for binomial distribution. It may look complicated, but don't worry. It just tells us the chance of getting X chocolate chip cookies if we drew N cookies, where P and Q are the same as before. We can use this formula to calculate this area, which then represents the possibility of getting 12 or fewer chocolate chip cookies. If that probability is less than our established 5% significance level, we can reject our null hypothesis. Let's plug in 30 for n, 12 for x, and 0.5 for p and q. We get 0.0805, which means that there was just an over 8% chance of getting exactly 12 chocolate chip cookies if we drew 30 times. But remember, we're trying to find this entire area, so we need to repeat this process for 11 chocolate chip cookies, 10 chocolate chip cookies, and so on, all the way to zero chocolate chip cookies, and then add the results together. If we do that, we get 0.181, or an 18% chance. Not bad. In this case, we just got a little unlucky, but 18% isn't so low that I would start to think that maybe there aren't really equal amounts of chocolate chip and snickerdoodle cookies. Now what if I had my friends do the same exercise, but instead of 12 chocolate chip cookies, they only got four? We'd be real suspicious then, right? Let's see what the math says. If we do all the calculations we did before, but starting at four cookies instead of 12, we see that the chance of this happening, assuming that there's an equal number of both kinds, is only 0.003%. Since this is much lower than our established 5% significance level, we can reject the null hypothesis, meaning that there are probably less than 50% chocolate chip cookies in the bag. This was just a binomial distribution function example, but like I said earlier, there are lots of different kinds for all sorts of situations. Hypothesis testing is used in many different fields such as test engineering, data analysis and research, and quality control. It's super useful! So there you have it. Next time someone promises you something that doesn't seem quite feasible or right, you can use your newfound skills of hypothesis testing to statistically evaluate whether it's too good to be true.